most secretive and unaccountable counterterrorism policies, policies that arose in the wake of 9-11. My name is Priyanka Mudoparthi, and I direct the project on armed conflict, counterterrorism, and human rights at Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute. Today marks the inaugural event in our year-long series, 20 years after 9-11, addressing an enduring legacy of harm. Our series is an opportunity to reflect on how we continue to live in a political, military, and legal framework that stems from our country's reaction in the aftermath of those attacks. 9-11 was a tragedy for the United States, and that tragedy was compounded by the many human rights abuses that followed, both domestically and globally. These include torture and secret detention, extraordinary rendition, indefinite detention at Guantanamo Bay, domestic surveillance, and a topic that is part of today's discussion, the secretive and unaccountable program of lethal strikes outside recognized armed conflict. These practices impacted and continue to impact primarily brown, black, and Muslim communities, both at home and abroad. Columbia's Human Rights Institute has a long and proud history of human rights research and advocacy on many of these issues. Columbia Law School students, in particular those in our human rights clinic, have done vital work investigating the role of diplomatic assurances and the transfer of U.S. detainees, um, exposing how estimates of civilian casualties caused by U.S. drone strikes have systematically undercounted their true impact, and advocating for greater transparency and accountability in the US Lethal Strike Program. This year, our event series will include talks on topics including the costs of our post 9-11 wars, accountability for all human rights abuses in Afghanistan, and how to responsibly close the prison at Guantanamo Bay. Next Thursday, we will host a panel of experts to address the ongoing civilian impact of US drone strikes and other counterterrorism operations in Somalia, which have been justified under novel and expansive legal theories. I hope many of you will join us. But the series is not just an opportunity for reflection. 20 years after the attacks of 9-11, we aim to bring, to bring together those who have dedicated themselves to better understanding the impacts, including the human costs of post 9-11 policies. We also aim to connect a new group of advocates and activists, today's student community, I'm confident that some of you will go on to make your own vital contributions to this work. With that, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today, as I know you're eager to hear from them. Both of them bring years worth of expertise litigating and exposing harmful post 9-11 practices. Jeremy Scahill is a founding editor of The Intercept, a leading investigative news site. He's also an editor at large and a senior correspondent there. He's the author of Dirty Wars, an investigative book examining U.S. covert lethal operations, including night raids and drone strikes in Yemen, Afghanistan, and Somalia, which he later produced and wrote as an Academy Award-nominated film. Most pertinent to our discussion today, he wrote, along with the staff of The Intercept, a series of articles later turned into a book, The Assassination Complex. This reporting relied on documents, including classified and top secret documents provided by, anonym, by an anonymous source inside the US military. Through these documents, his reporting exposed vital details of the US program of lethal strikes, including drone strikes outside recognized armed conflict. Our second speaker is Jamil Jaffer, director of the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. In his work at the Knight Institute, Jamil works to defend freedom of speech on the press through litigation, research, and education. He is the former deputy legal director of the ACLU, where he led litigation in key national security cases, including FOIA litigation to learn more about counterterrorism policies and seeking accountability for U.S. drone strikes that killed U.S. citizens. He edited and published a book, The Drone Memos, which collected documents he received through FOIA litigation. Jamil has written multiple articles on our debt to whistleblowers and the role they have played in holding our government to account. He recently penned a post for the Knight Institute on the case of Daniel Hale, an intelligence analyst who leaked documents exposing faults in the US drone strike program. He also criticized the government's use of the Espionage Act more broadly. At the end of July, 
a U.S. District Court sentenced Daniel Hale to 45 months in prison for violating the Espionage Act. I'll turn it over to our speakers with introductory remarks, first from Jeremy, then from Jamil. After they speak, I'll ask them a few questions, and then we will have time for audience questions, which you can submit through the Q&A function of the chat. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And Jeremy, I'll ask you to start. Well, thank you very much, Priyanka. And it's um, always an honor to be on a panel uh, or share a venue with Jamil Jaffer, one of the uh, great lawyers of the post 9-11 world. And, and I just wanted to start out by, by saying something about uh, a crossroads that Jamil and I often uh, met at during the course of, of the uh, post 9-11 so-called counterterrorism operations. And, and that is the question of whether the United States government has a right to assassinate people uh, around the world and, and, and perhaps more, more specifically, whether it has the right to assassinate its own citizens. Um, Jamil, uh, along with Hina Shamsi and Pardis Kabrai and, and a team of excellent lawyers from the ACLU and the Center for Constitutional Rights, took on one of the most important cases of the post 9-11 reality that we still live in. Uh, and that was the, the question of the drone strike assassination of uh, Anwar al laki who uh, was a cleric, uh, a Muslim cleric who was born in the United States, was a US citizen, um, and was uh, operating a YouTube channel where he was advocating for uh, insurrection against the United States and, uh, and praising attacks against the United States, though there was uh, very flimsy evidence to indicate that he had any actual uh, involvement directly with terror plots. Uh, both uh, Anwar al and then a couple of weeks later, his uh, teenage son, uh, Abdul Rahman al a 16-year-old American citizen, both of them were killed in, in drone strikes. In the case of Anwar al the United States government asserted that it had a right to kill him uh, because he uh, was engaged in uh, terrorist plots against the United States. In the case of Abdul Rahman al a 16-year-old boy who was killed as he uh, ate dinner with, uh, with some relatives, uh, the U.S. government has never provided an adequate explanation for why this child was killed. In fact, the only semi-official comment that we've ever heard on it came from Robert Gibbs, the uh, former spokesperson for Barack Obama, who said that this 16-year-old boy, his death was indicative that he should have had a more responsible father. It was one of the most disgraceful statements uh, in post-9-11 America to be delivered um, by anyone who had served in, in office to justify um, the murder of an American teenager that uh, there were no allegations he was involved whatsoever uh, in terrorism. And it's a stain on this country uh, that this happened under Mr. Constitutional Law expert transformative president Barack Obama. And I, I bring this up because Jamil and others fought tooth and nail uh, against the Obama administration uh, to try to bring accountability, uh, not just for the more complicated case of killing an American citizen that's suspected of supporting terrorism, but in the clear cut case of killing an unarmed American teenage civilian who was not accused of any crimes, nor has anyone alleged he was involved with terrorism, but for uh, the, the fact that he was born to a father that the United States hated. Um, and ultimately the ACLU and the CCR lost that case, though they made the best legal arguments they possibly could have made. And it was uh, really, if, if there was no case that would have resulted in justice, uh, if there was any case that would have resulted in justice for the United States assassination policy, it would have been that one. The clear cut case of an innocent teenager murdered by his own government in a drone strike half a world away. Um, and, and I think it really is a sobering reminder uh, uh, that even if you have great legal minds, even if your arguments are sound, even if you have morality on your side, the state uh, always protects its interests. And in this case, it was protecting the interests of an unaccountable assassination policy. Uh, in uh, 2014 and 2015, The Intercept published a series of secret and top secret documents that represented the first and most comprehensive leak in American history on the US policy of assassination. These documents showed that uh, in some operations, as many of nine out of 10 people killed in so-called targeted strikes were not the intended target, meaning that uh, nine out of 10 people that the US was killing in its drone strike and to a lesser extent, uh, night raids 
the United States government didn't know their identities. Maybe they were hardened terrorists, or maybe they were totally innocent people, as happened recently when the Biden administration uh, uh, authorized a drone strike that killed a family in Afghanistan as part of the U.S. Uh, withdrawal. Um, but the fact is that those nine out of 10 people we learned from these documents would be preemptively categorized as enemies killed in action unless they were posthumously proven to have been civilians. Um, and, and that was laid, laid out clear in these documents. Uh, also significant uh, was that uh, the source who provided these documents to us gave us a 180 plus page rule book for watch listing uh, people, the terror watch list system. Um, some of you watching may have experienced this where you go to check in for your flight. Uh, it used to be that you would have four S's on your ticket. Um, you know, you, you had to then go for additional screening. It happened to me all the time when I was doing war reporting. Uh, you're in the matrix of the watch listing system and you can end up in that system, we learned from these documents, uh, just by having texted with someone who texted with someone in Pakistan that the United States doesn't know who that person is, but they think that your, uh, your communications are suspicious. Uh, a lot of uh, people in the United States who are of uh, Arab or Iranian or Pakistani origin find themselves in this matrix simply because they're communicating with their loved ones overseas. What this document revealed was a parallel extrajudicial system for denying rights, not only to uh, foreign nationals, uh, but to American citizens uh, as well. These documents that represented the largest leak on the U.S. assassination program gave lie to so many of the pronouncements, particularly of the Obama administration. You know, Bush and Cheney were sort of evil incorporated, and Cheney in particular made no bones about wanting to work with what he called the, the forces of the dark side um, and was an open advocate for torturing people. But Obama claimed that he was doing th things differently. Obama claimed that drone strikes were an alternative to big ground operations, that they were a more precise way of waging war. These documents gave lie to that pronouncement and showed that the uh, Obama administration embraced a mathematical formula for determining when it uh, killed civilians that would almost always result in the number zero when the question was asked how many innocent people died in your drone strikes. And the response after we, we published uh, these articles uh, was very little other pickup in the, the corporate media, but uh, a ferocious response on the part of the national security apparatus. The person that the uh, US government believed was responsible for these leaks was the man that you mentioned, Daniel Hale. And in fact, his home was raided under the Obama administration uh, but Obama, who had shattered all records for prosecutions of whistleblowers under the Espionage Act, and in fact, prosecuted more people under the act than all of his predecessors combined, the Obama administration ultimately, uh, for whatever reason, decided not to go ahead with a prosecution of, of Daniel Hale. And I, I, I would, you know, this is just conjecture on my part, but I think it's, it's on sound ground, and Jamil may have something to say on this. My sense was that Obama and his administration realized that uh, they were on the wrong side of history, that they were engaged in problematic actions by wielding the Espionage Act in this manner, and they were really terrified of the standard that they had set for someone like a Donald Trump or another version of, of Bush and Cheney. And so toward the very, very end, I'm talking the last months of the Obama administration, they scrambled uh, to try to put in place some semblance of rules for what would happen after, I think they wanted Hillary Clinton to take over clearly, but uh, if, if Donald Trump had won, and it was really insufficient, but, but suffice to say, they did not prosecute Daniel Hale. What happened was that the Trump administration comes to power and Trump was obsessed with leaks coming out of his administration. He was particularly concerned that there were going to be leaks of his tax returns, uh, that there were leaks about his conduct in, in, in office, that there were going to be leaks about his family members, that there were going to be leaks about his incompetence. Um, and, and that combined with some of the neoconservatives that Trump had embraced in his administration, uh, most prominently Mike Pompeo, who was CIA director and secretary of state, uh, they, th those interests, Trump's paranoia and the neocon desire to crush all leakers or whistleblowers uh, combined uh, together to create a strategy where they had to set examples. 
Uh, and, and they clearly chose the intercept as one of the whipping posts that they were going to use. So you had the, uh, pr the prosecution of Reality Winner, who was convicted of having leaked the document uh, dealing with uh, Russian attempts to penetrate software systems used in some US voting systems across the country. Uh, they went after um, Terry Albury, uh, African-American FBI agent who was convicted of uh, revealing documents that showed broad misconduct on the part of the FBI and racial profiling. Um, and then they went and they dug up this case that was dormant and unprosecuted by Obama of Daniel Hale. And they really, really went to town on Daniel Hale. They threatened him with decades in prison. They, uh, they tried to make it so that he would have no ability to explain his actions. That's part of the scandal of the Espionage Act. It's why Edward Snowden remains in Moscow instead of coming back uh, to face a trial, which he said he would gladly do if he was allowed to present the defense. Um, and so Daniel Hale is now uh, serving upwards of a four year prison sentence. This is an individual who should be hailed as a hero who revealed that his own government and a system that he was a part of because he did work on kill operations is murdering people with no accountability, including its own citizens, is lying and deceiving the public about the extent of civilians killed in these operations. And in conclusion, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say, the news that we have seen in the past few days, broken by Michael Isakoff and his colleagues at Yahoo News, uh, about the CIA's plots to assassinate or kidnap Julian Assange should send shockwaves through every newsroom in this country. I know that it's in mode to beat up on Julian Assange. Oh, he helped Trump. He was just trying to get back at Hillary Clinton. Uh, he was sexually uh, ass assaulting women in Sweden. All of, those, uh, all of those issues are valid to discuss, but none of those issues erase the fact that Julian Assange was a legitimate publisher of vital information, including documents that revealed unaccountable war policies in Iraq and Afghanistan, the killing of civilians, including journalists, the dirty deeds that the US government had engaged in uh, around the world. Whatever you think of Julian Assange, failure to speak up clearly about the unjust treatment of this man who is rotting away in a British prison cell for the crime of publishing documents the United States wanted to be kept secret, the failure to stand up for him is an unforgivable sin on the part of anyone that believes in freedom of the press or basic civil liberties. Thank you, Jeremy. We'll now turn to Jamil for your introductory remarks. All right, um, so thanks Priyanka and, and uh, great to be here and um, Great to share a stage with Jeremy. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe I'll try to make some broader, you know, sort of broader remarks about about whistleblower. So, you know, I I, I share uh, Jeremy's sort of attitude towards the um, successive administrations' prosecution of whistleblowers over the last twenty years. I mean, my my view, uh, which I I think Jeremy shares, is that the U.S. has uh, or Americans have, play, have paid a very, very high price for excessive secrecy since 9-11. And um, you can see, you know, I think any objective consideration of the facts here uh, makes clear that over and over again, um, national security policies were crafted behind closed doors. Um, they were deeply flawed uh, and they were protected. The fact that they were protected from public scrutiny meant that they stayed in place for much longer than they would uh, otherwise have done. And, um, you know, it's not just, not just that, you know, we didn't learn about these things when we could have learned about them. It's also that corrections that later took place took place much, much later than they would have uh, otherwise because of the secrecy surrounding these programs. And if you try, if you think about national security debate um, uh, since 9-11, uh, and just try to imagine what it would have looked like without the disclosures of, uh, of whistleblowers. I mean, it's worth it's worthwhile to do. You know, we we learned about the Abu Ghraib uh, abuses only because a soldier, Joe Darby, um, uh, gave photographs to um, uh, to the press. Uh, we learned about uh, the CIA's black sites only because anonymous CIA officers who were deeply um, uh, uncomfortable with the CIA's policies at those black sites 
uh, uh, shared information with Dana Priest at the, at, at the Washington Post. Um, virtually everything we know about the excesses of NSA surveillance after 9-11, we learned we learn because Snowden shared that information with The Guardian uh, and The Washington Post. Um, you know, the same is true of sort of, you know, it, it's Chelsea Manning who disclosed war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and Daniel Hale, as we've already discussed, you know, is, is, is significantly responsible for uh, what we know about the true scope of, uh, of the drone campaign and the, the true implications of the drone campaign. And you just try to imagine what national security debate or what public debate would have looked like in the United States uh, if we had not had disclosures of official secrets that the government would have preferred to suppress. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's an exaggeration at all to say that public debate uh, would have been just a kind of farce, uh, but for those kinds of disclosures. And you don't have to, you know, you don't have to think that every single disclosure was justified uh, or that these people, the people who disclosed official secrets, did so or always did so with the purest of motives. Um, you don't even have to believe that um, none of the disclosures was harmful in order to recognize the pivotal role that uh, whistleblowers have played since 9 11. Uh, and again, not just played in informing the public, but played in kind of keeping national security policy at least connected in some attenuated way to democratic consent. Because after those disclosures were made, you know, after, uh, for example, um, uh, the Snowden disclosures uh, came to light, government institutions uh, course corrected, uh, you know, not always willingly, uh, but they were forced to cor course correct through civil litigation, uh, through um, uh, national security journalism, uh, sometimes immediately and sometimes over time, uh, government policy uh, kind of got reined in because of those disclosures. And so we have these whistleblowers to thank, not just for informing the public, but uh, for keeping national security po uh, policy as connected as it is to democratic consent. I don't want to suggest that it is completely connected to, to democratic consent, but it would be uh, far less connected uh, if not for these, you know, if not for these, these whistleblowers. And uh, and yet, in spite of all of that, we treat whistleblowers extremely harshly. You know, as Jeremy mentioned, um, you know, the use of the Espionage Act now against journalist sources uh, is almost routine. Uh, in the 20th century, only one person was convicted under the Espionage Act for sharing official secrets with the press. That was Samuel Morrison, and he was pardoned by President Clinton in 2001. Um, after 9-11, Successive administrations used the Espionage Act very aggressively uh, to go after journalist sources, uh, not spies, which is what you know people normally associate with the Espionage Act, but journalist sources. Um, and the use of the Espionage Act uh, is problematic for a number of reasons. One of them is that the penalties associated with the Espionage Act are extremely severe. So if you um, you know if you're charged under the Espionage Act, you are exposed to the possibility of uh, decades in prison. Um, but another problem is that the Espionage Act doesn't leave any room for consideration of the public interest in disclosure. The only thing that matters under the Espionage Act um, is whether the government says what was released was a national security secret. And if that is the case, then the public's interest in the disclosure is irrelevant. And over and over again, whistleblowers have tried to challenge that kind of rule, uh, starting with Daniel Ellsberg, challenge this kind of um, uh, uh, you know, restriction on making public interest arguments in the context of espionage act prosecutions, uh, but unsuccessfully. So the system we have now is one that values the government's interest in secrecy, I would say grossly overvalues the government's interest in secrecy, and grossly undervalues, doesn't value at all, the public's uh, larger democratic interest um, in uh, ensuring that national uh, security policy is connected to, dem to, to democratic consent. Uh, and I see that as not just sort of, um, you know, morally indefensible, I say morally indefensible because, you know, we habitually honor journalists who publish stories based on the disclosures of uh, whistleblowers. We should uh, honor them, uh, you know, but they get Pulitzer Prizes uh, for, um, you know, for disclosing and uh, reporting on the disclosures that whistleblowers uh, provide. Whistleblowers, in the meantime, are prosecuted for those very same disclosures. 
And um, you know, I don't see how we as a society can justify the dif differential treatment. I mean, if the reporting on these issues is so important, then we should be honoring, honoring the whistleblowers who make that reporting possible, not just uh, the reporters. Uh, so that's why I say it's morally indefensible. But I also think that it's deeply dangerous to our democracy because um, socially beneficial leaks are um, uh, disincentivized. Uh, not just disincentivized, but sort of uh, radically disincentivized by the penalties associated with the Espionage Act and the threat that the Espionage Act poses to anybody who wants to inform the public uh, about even gross government misconduct or abuse of one kind or another relating to national security. All of that stuff is kind of off limits. If you want to inform the public about that stuff, you have to be willing to go to prison and not just go to prison, but go to prison for a very long time. And I think that the result of that is that we know far less about uh, government policy in this sphere uh, than we should. There's this uh, famous line from J Justice White in the Pentagon Papers case in, in which he notes that the only effective check uh, on government power in the national security sphere comes from uh, national security journalism uh, and an informed public. But uh, that check is what is being undermined uh, by the legal regime that we have right now. Um, I think I will, you know, leave it at that. I also want to address what Jeremy, uh, you know, raised at the end about uh, the Assange case, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave that uh, for now. Thank you so much, Jamil. Um, I'll start with a few questions for you both. And Jamil, I'll start with one for you. So Jeremy raised the case of Anwar al Awlaki and his son. Tomorrow actually marks 20 years since a U.S. drone strike killed, killed Anwar al Awlaki in Yemen. He spent years at the ACLU representing his father for his killing and also for the killing of his 16-year-old son. But you also lit litigated FOIA requests seeking information about his case and about the U.S. lethal strike program more broadly. What would you say about the value of the information you gained by appealing directly to the U.S. government for transparency and public accountability? Would FOIA be enough? It is a mechanism by which the U.S. government is meant to be more transparent, by which people can make appeals for transparency. How does that compare to the value of information gained through whistleblower disclosures? Yeah, I mean, there's no there's no comparison. Um, so first of all, the 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 cases that we we brought on behalf of family members of um, people who have been killed in drone, stri drone strikes. Uh, those were dismissed on political question grounds, state secrets grounds, uh, Bivens special factors, there are all sorts of jurisdictional and threshold doctrines that uh, the courts relied on to justify not reaching the merits in those cases. But secrecy is at the bottom of all of those doctrines. Um, you know, government secrecy made it impossible for us to litigate these issues in court, even though the stuff that the government said was secret was actually well known to, I mean, at least, you know, uh, anybody who had witnessed, witnessed these strikes in Yemen or, uh, or um, you know, or, or Afghanistan, um, you know, there were no, there are no secrets being kept from them. The only secrets here were, 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 were the ones being kept from the American people. Uh, and more than that, I think secrecy was being used as a kind of uh, tool to avoid accountability. It wasn't real secrecy. It was a kind of, um, uh, you know, Rumsfeld would have had a phrase for it, some version of, you know, known unknowns or something like that, where everybody knows, um, you know, what is purportedly, pur purportedly secret, but our institutions are not willing to acknowledge those facts. Uh, that's what it was like to litigate those, you know, those kind of affirmative constitutional cases. Um, FOIA runs up against a different set of obstacles. So, you know, FOIA is in many different spheres, a very powerful tool and, you know, arguably uh, a, a too powerful tool in some spheres because FOIA is increasingly being used to uh, prevent government agencies from doing things that we need government agencies to do, in particular, regulatory agencies uh, are being tied up in knots uh, with FOIA litigation brought by uh, the entities that they are supposed to be regulating. Uh, uh, David Posen, who's a professor at, um, at Columbia Law School, has written a, you know, very compellingly about that problem. But in the national security sphere, FOIA is an extremely weak tool. 
Uh, and it's an extremely weak tool for a number of reasons. One is that um, FOIA, uh, you know, the question that courts consider in the, in the context of FOIA is whether uh, information is properly classified. And the question of whether information is properly classified is one that is uh, committed exclusively, or that's the way the courts see it, exclusively to the executive branch. And so the same officials who uh, develop these policies, like the drone policies, for example, get to decide how much the public knows about the drone policies. Sometimes at the margin, there's something that litigators can do, um, uh, you know, where the government has, you know, made the mistake of disclosing one fact, maybe you can um, get a court to require the government to disclose documents that are mainly about that fact. Uh, but that kind of litigation really takes place just at the margins. I mean, we were able to, in this um, uh, case uh, that ended up in the Second Circuit, get the Second Circuit to require the Obama administration to release uh, one of the Office of Legal Counsel memos that was the basis for the strike against Anwar al uh, But, you know, that, uh, you know, which I think ma many people think of as a kind of major victory under FOIA. It was a major victory. Uh, but, you know, it's important to sort of uh, keep perspective on it. The reason we were able to win is because we were able to convince the court that the administration had released so much already that the release of that memo wouldn't cause any harm. And, you know, that's really the most you can hope for under FOIA. Uh, we had the same kind of experience in um, uh, a case in the D.C. Circuit, which ended up being called ACLU versus CIA. It was a Judge Garland wrote it, uh, actually. But that case was about whether the CIA had to acknowledge an interest in the drone campaign. And, you know, everybody and his dog already knew that the CIA had an interest in the drone campaign. Uh, uh, but it became a matter of federal litigation, you know, to get the CIA to acknowledge that in court or get a court to acknowledge it. Um, and that, you know, too, was, you know, considered a really major uh, FOIA victory, and it was, in a sense, a very mo uh, major FOIA victory, but it was also an extremely limited victory, and that's the most you can hope for uh, with FOIA. So, uh, you know, all of the kind of more granular details we know about um, uh, drone strikes and the civilian implications of drone strikes and the human costs sort of more broadly of drone strikes, uh, that comes not from FOIA, it comes from whistleblowers. Thank you, Jamil. Jeremy, I have a question for you. Given the very real dangers that Jamil has painted that whistleblowers face under the Espionage Act, the prospect of years or even decades in prison, how did you think through the implications of publishing information obtained through disclosures versus the risks to your source and the risks to your publication? Um, and do you feel like these risks have changed over time, perhaps under different administrations? You know, I think I think each case is is different, and and Jamil sort of uh, alluded to this, but um, you know, sometimes you have uh, a source that is providing you with information, uh, and they have their own uh, agenda that may or may not be known to you. Um, that they they're either trying to uh, settle a score, or they're trying to push through a particular uh, policy. Um, you know, it's very common for leaks to right wing media outlets. Uh, to be intended to agitate for a more belligerent uh, policy, uh, for instance. There have been cases, particularly, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a specific case about leaks to Fox News that had to do with Korea policy, and it seems pretty clear that the individual who was leaking the information uh, wanted to put pressure on the Obama administration to conform to a, 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 a what the source perceived to be a sort of more right-wing or conservative uh, policy path to take. And you always have to be um, you know, willing to scrutinize the motive of the source. Um, however, in some cases, you don't know who the source is when you're receiving uh, documents anonymously. And, and so for that reason, you can't limit your willingness to publish classified documents to having done a thorough moral and legal and ethical vetting of a source. It, you know, the standard should be, is it in the public interest to publish this information. That's that is the, that's the most important uh, factor to in terms of its publishability. Uh, when it comes to risks for the source, um, I think that you have to have a very serious, sober conversation with any potential source who is going to reveal classified information to you. I do believe 
that the onus is uh, in part on the journalist in those cases to uh, make sure that the source understands uh, the risks associated with their action and what it would mean for them uh, if these documents uh, or this information is published and it is somehow traced back to them that they are going to have uh, a, a relentless, vicious prosecution um, unearthed against them, uh, unleashed against them under the Espionage Act where they are uh, going to be legally barred from actually presenting any sort of a real defense in court. Um, and so in the cases in my work as a journalist, where I have worked with confidential sources, um, I've, I've always wanted to have that conversation with the source. Um, and you know, there, there's a difference between, you know, can you ethically publish something is different than the human factor um, where, where you say, you know, do, is, it, is it right to do this? And I think that that is for each journalist and each source to make a decision. But if, if you're uh, faced with a source who uh, is, is operating from a, a position of tremendous moral clarity. And they are stating that they know what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, and the potential consequences to them, which was certainly the case of Edward Snowden uh, when he provided documents to Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald. Um, you know, then, then I, I, I think you, you publish realizing that the odds are that this government with all of its resources um, is more likely to catch and prosecute that individual no matter what uh, uh, tools they deploy to try to preserve their secrecy. Um, you know, this is a government that has, that would make the, the Stasi blush with its technological capabilities in, 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 in its uh, uh, ability to monitor communications to, in fact, this didn't get any media attention, but we're, we're in a kind of nerd circle here, so I can mention it. There was a filing um, late in the Daniel Hale prosecution that I haven't seen anyone uh, report on where the government uh, submitted uh, a request to go back and re-examine all of Hale's electronic devices, saying that they had updated uh, capabilities to break the encryption on devices. And they sought, and I believe were granted, uh, an order that they could go and deploy this new technology against Daniel Hale's electronic devices. I don't know, you know the outcome of that, but it was interesting to read that filing that the government um, is constantly looking for ways either through collaboration with Silicon Valley or big tech companies or through its own offensive and defensive hacking capabilities to penetrate communication. So the, it, it may seem like a long-winded answer, but I don't think it's that simple of an answer. I think that you, you, you first have to say to yourself and, and really assess it and talk to your lawyers and your editors, is this in the public interest? If the answer to that is yes, and you know the identity of the source, or you at least know some information about the source and have access to be able to talk to them, then I think you have to have a very serious conversation about the risk factor associated with this. I don't know that I would be able to move forward with publishing um, the fruits of a sensitive national security leak if I felt like the source wasn't aware of the mighty powers that are going to align against that individual and bring the full power of the American security state down on their head. I think it would be morally dubious for a journalist to uh, engage in that conduct. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Jamil, I'm going to turn back to you. Uh, Jeremy has described having these types of conversations about the risks that whistleblowers face. What legal protections, if any, do whistleblowers enjoy? All of the individuals whose disclosures and, you know, um, sharing with the press that you mentioned, you know, did, you know, made those disclosures out of a strong sense of moral responsibility. And Daniel Hill himself wrote a very compelling letter to the judge in his case, explaining his reasons for sharing the information that he did you know, describing how seeing what he saw, knew, knowing what he knew really compelled him to take a moral stand and to decide to share this information. Do whistleblowers' intent matter at all? Um, and, you know, does the value of what they provide come into the legal consideration? Does it provide any protection? Do either of those factors matter in a court? Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned that letter. Um, I mean, that letter is extremely powerful, and I just recommend that it's short. I recommend everybody read it. Um, this is a letter that Daniel Hale filed in connection with the sentencing. Um, 
uh, I, I don't know where you find it online, except that I tweeted it a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it's really worth reading. It's very, 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 very powerful. Um, so as a general matter, there are protections for whistleblowers. Most of those protections are unavailable to national security whistleblowers. Um, there are circumstances in which national security whistleblowers who disclose information to Congress uh, uh, or to IGs are protected. But the kinds of um, whistleblowing that I think uh, are, are, are most important uh, and most valuable to the public are unlikely uh, to result in change through that kind of reporting. Uh, the kind of whistleblowing that I think is most important to the public is whistleblowing that shows that the systems of oversight have failed. Um, you know, where congressional uh, intelligence committees may already know what's going on, but may have signed off on it. Um, uh, or IGs may already know what's going on, but have not found it troubling. And, um, you know, I think the NSA disclosures are a great example of this, you know, or even torture, you know, where um, uh, the institutions that were supposed to check in the case of the NSA surveillance uh, programs, it was the FISA court. Uh, in the case of, you know, torture, it was the intelligence committees. You, you, these are the institutions that were supposed to check abuse and they had failed to do that. Um, those are the kinds of disclosures that are most important. Um, I think those kinds of disclosures, you know, if everything is going uh, as it should be, um, you know, those kinds of disclosures should be relatively rare, but in the circumstance in which those disclosures are made, I think it's crucial that whistleblowers should have the opportunity to argue to uh, a court that their disclosures were justified. Uh, and that's um, the opportunity that they're denied right now under the, you know, under the Espionage Act. And it's the same opportunity that FOIA litigators are denied when they try to challenge uh, the legitimacy of government secrecy surrounding national security, because, you know, as I said earlier, what ultimately matters in the FOIA case is whether the information is properly classified. And that is, uh, you know, a question that is effectively committed to the, you know, executive branch. It's a question of, um, uh, you know, the executive order on classification. And the executive order on classification doesn't create any room for, the, for a consideration of the public interest. So um, you know, right now, I'd say you know, across the board, our system, um, uh, you know, as I said earlier, er, earlier, kind of grossly undervalues the democratic interest in an informed public, um, you know, in favor of grossly overvaluing the government's, you know, important but much narrower interest in uh, maintaining the confidentiality of national security programs. Yeah, can, can I just say something and follow up to that? Yes. Uh, you know, one, one of the Jeremy, can yeah, I just yeah. uh, ask our audience to put questions they have in the Q and A function, just because we're short on time, and then go ahead. I, I just wanted to say, you know, regarding Daniel Hale, one of the documents that he was convicted of having leaked to uh, a news organization, which it's it's clear that when they're talking about that, they're talking about. Uh, the intercept, though they never mention the intercept specifically by uh, by name in the indictment or proceedings, um, this watch listing rule book, the rules for putting people on the terror watch list, after that document was published across this country, court cases were brought to remove people from this list, and judges across the country uh, ruled in favor of plaintiffs in cases of people who had unjustly been placed on the watch list. And one of the key documents, in fact, if you talk to some of the lead lawyers who litigated those cases, because that document was published, injustices were corrected. People were removed from a draconian Kafka-esque parallel judicial system that was labeling them as known or suspected terrorists, having grand implications for their employment and their lives. The person who leaked that document should be thanked for their public service. And one of the three branches of our government, the, 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 uh, the judicial branch, its representatives across this country repeatedly utilized that document to correct injustices uh, again, committed against people by their own government. So, and, 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 you know, Hale would never have been allowed to make that argument in court. Why? because he was charged under the Espionage Act and you were not allowed to say why you did anything or to introduce evidence that it corrected systemic injustice, which was the truth in that case. 
Yeah, I mean, the same was true, right, of um, you know, government surveillance before the 2013 disclosures, the, the Snowden disclosures. So, you know, in the in the weeks or months immediately preceding those disclosures, um, the James Clapper, who was the director of national intelligence, testified to Congress that uh, the NSA was not collecting in, uh, information about millions of Americans, which was false, um, as he himself conceded later. Uh, the Supreme Court had rejected civil challenges to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act on the grounds that it was just too speculative to think that the NSA would be engaged in mass surveillance. Um, the Justice Department uh, was supposed to be notifying criminal defendants uh, when it was relying on evidence derived from um, FISA surveillance, and it wasn't doing that. So there were all those kind of failures or um, uh, even sort of false government falsehoods um, delivered to the American public in the weeks or months immediately before those disclosures. And then Snowden discloses what he discloses, and um, the FISA court for the first time considers the constitutional implications of the call records program, which was a, a particularly controversial program. Uh, a federal appeals court struck down that program on, cons uh, on, on statutory grounds. Um, the, the President Obama uh, convened a, a, a review group to look at all of these programs. The review group made a number of recommendations, some of which the Obama administration accepted. So all of that happened because of those disclosures. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that it's, you know, it, even, even Obama administration officials, including President Obama himself, uh, acknowledged that uh, all of that stuff wouldn't have happened but for the disclosures. Uh, and yet we have this system in which a whistleblower who discloses information like that is subject to decades in prison and denied the opportunity even to argue to a court uh, that, the, that the disclosures were justified. Thank you, Jamil. We have about 10 minutes left and I wanna to turn to some of our audience questions. So here is one. Do you think it's undemocratic for whistleblowers who are unelected operatives to supersede the will of elected governments, whatever the moral justifications are? And maybe to, to expand this question a little bit, we've talked about in our conversation whistleblowers whose disclosures have had clear public value, who have resulted in accountability, important information the American public wouldn't have otherwise had um, that provided accountability, oversight, and as you mentioned, course correction in the case of these programs. Um, consider the case of a whistleblower who provides um, unilaterally information that is you know, less valuable or potentially more dangerous. Have you seen these cases before? How would you respond to this question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would think that that was undemocratic and, um, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't propose that um, every government employee should decide for himself or herself um, you know, what's in the public interest and what's not. At a certain, you know, when a, when a whistleblower or when a government employee comes across information that, um, you know, relates to government abuse, um, you know, abuse of human rights or unlawful conduct, um, I think the whistleblower needs to make a judgment, but we don't need to defer to the whistleblower's judgment. Uh, I think ultimately that judgment should be put to a court. The difference right now, what happens is, um, anyone who discloses government secrets can claim the mantle of whistleblower, uh, never has to defend that decision um, in, any formal, uh, in, in any formal process. And on the other side, you have the government, which categorically um, you know, condemns whistleblowers as kind of you know, traitorous. And so you have this kind of you know, vast chasm between the, the self-styled whistleblowers, some of whom I think are not fairly characterized as whistleblowers and government officials who refuse to draw a distinction between those you know, two categories. And I think it would be a far better system if somebody who disclosed classified information uh, uh, had the opportunity or the obligation, you might think of it, the obligation to appear before a court and explain why they thought that the disclosure of that information was justified. And not just why it was justified, but they could also explain what um, 
what steps they had taken to ensure that the information that they were uh, disclosing didn't, uh, you know, include stuff that whose whose disclosure couldn't be justified. Uh, so in other words, you know, this is not just an opportunity for the whistleblower, it would also create incentives for people who are thinking about disclosing government secrets to disclose those secrets in a responsible way. Thank you, Jamil. Jeremy, Jeremy, do you want to respond to this one? You know, I, I think if you if you read carefully or listen to what Edward Snowden has said of, uh, about this issue, uh, you know, he and I, I think it's a, it's both a, a smart position and I believe it's a sincere position. Um, his his stance has been that he will come back to the United States uh, to stand trial for his actions if he is allowed to present a legitimate defense. Uh, it, you know, if you if you are actually interested in uh, accountability, uh, and you're not someone who's in favor of whistleblowers, you, you should be against the Espionage Act, um, because you can allow the courts then to litigate these matters and set a standard that is based on fairness and preserves the rights of the accused. Um, and I think Edward Snowden, ha it's both a, a politically smart, uh, but also a legally sound position that he's taken. This is an unjust law being wheeled in in an unjust manner. I mean, this, this law, the Espionage Act, goes back to 1918, one of the first people prosecuted under it uh, was a socialist political activist, uh, Eugene Debs. He said at the time in 1918, 1919, when he was one of the first cases uh, prosecuted under this, uh, this act, um, that if this is allowed to go forward, then the constitutional rights of people are dead. And, and I think in these cases, uh, it, it was not only a prescient remark, but unfortunately uh, remains very, very true uh, to this day. Uh, I also want to say Joe Biden has an atrocious record on the question of whistleblowers going back to his first year in the U.S. Senate, 1973-74. Uh, I won't get into all the details on this, but I will tell just one short story. When Joe Biden was chairing the hearings uh, of the Intelligence Committee, which had just uh, was, was in its nascent days, Jimmy Carter had nominated a, a, a sort of intelligence outsider as the CIA director, Ted Sorensen, who was a friend of the Kennedy family and perceived to be a very liberal guy. And Carter had pledged to sort of shake up the CIA. Anyway, they, uh, Biden finds out that Ted Sorensen had filed an affidavit or had written an affidavit in support of Daniel Ellsberg in the Pentagon Papers case. And Sorensen had said that when he was writing uh, his uh, biography of Kennedy, and, and other books, he had taken home uh, internal government documents to use for his writing. And he said, everyone in Washington does this. And so he had written this affidavit that actually wasn't even filed in the Ellsberg case. Biden goes back, digs that up, and in public says that he thinks that Ted Sorensen might, uh, should pro possibly be prosecuted under the Espionage Act. And Biden joined the Republicans in destroying not only Ted Sorensen's nomination, but his character in Washington. And repeatedly through his career, Biden has taken the side of the CIA. He collaborated with Reagan's notorious CIA director, William Casey, to intensify the crackdown on whistleblowers to go after people like CIA operative Philip Agee. And let's remember that Joe Biden was the president and it was his Justice Department that ultimately aggressively threw the book at Daniel Hale. Thanks, Jeremy. We have five minutes left, so I want to give you both the chance to respond to one final question and ask that you keep it to around two minutes um, so that everyone can, can end on time. Um, but you both alluded to this in your remarks, but I'd, I'd, I'd actually like you to spell it out very clearly for our audience. What would a good policy regulating these types of disclosures or relating to these types of disclosures looks like. Uh, the, fine, the Espionage Act doesn't work. It's not a good law. It's not been used in a manner that is protective of our democracy. So what would a better system look like? And Jamil, I'll ask you to, to go first. Um, I think I would start with a public interest defense under the Espionage Act. And you, know, you could implement that through statute or uh, you know, courts could effectively impose a First Amendment uh, defense, uh, graft a First Amendment defense onto the statute. Um, uh, so there are a variety of ways in which it could be done, but essentially I think that people charged under the Espionage Act with, for having provided official secrets uh, to the public or the press should be, an afford, should be afforded an opportunity to explain why they did it. Um, and to you know, make the case that the disclosures were justified given the 
public interest in you know the information that that they revealed. So I would start with that. Um, I'm not sure I would stop there. I think that uh, considerations of the public interest should ha also have a role to play in the decision to classify information in the first place. Um, so I think that the executive order on classification should be amended to incorporate um, uh, more clearly uh, uh, a requirement that classifiers, classifying authorities uh, take the public interest into account. Uh, we also at the Knight Institute have a challenge uh, um, uh, pending now to the pre-publication review system, which um, you know is eff effectively a system of prior restraints on current and former government employees who want to talk about their government service. Uh, there too, I think uh, the restrictions on speech are unjustifiable. Uh, but I think sort of across the national security sphere, uh, we give far too much weight. Uh, we give a kind of a trump card to the government's narrow interest in protecting the confidentiality of national security programs. I don't want to suggest that's unimportant, uh, but it is less important uh, and certainly needs to be weighed against the, the, the broader democratic interest in uh, ensuring an informed public, and ensuring that national security policy reflects democratic consent. Thank you, Jeremy. Will you share your thoughts on that question as well? I, I agree completely um, and defer to Jamil on, on legal questions, but um, just as a non-lawyer, uh, but as someone who follows these cases, uh, I think a minimal step would be uh, when, when someone is accused of, of the crime of whistleblowing or revealing classified information, the idea that they don't have the ability to explain their actions to a judge or jury to me is is just strikes me as as fundamentally unconstitutional with regards to the rights of the accused. So I agree with all of the policy suggestions that Jamil has made and is agitating for. But there's also a more systemic issue here, and that is that this government under Democrats and Republicans is drunk with uh, overclassification and excessive secrecy, and the consequences for lying, including under oath. Uh, in, in front of lawmakers, as James Clapper and, um, and John Brennan both did, and neither of them were prosecuted for perjury, the, the penalties should be severe, severe for intelligence officials who lie to lawmakers whose job is oversight. And the final thing that I'll say uh, is that we need a dramatic overhaul of the powers, abilities, and relationships of the intelligence committees of the Senate and the House. Uh, people like Dianne Feinstein were way too close to the CIA. She did some good things. You know, she got angry at the right times at various moments. She also collaborated to run cover for the CIA. That should be unacceptable. There needs to be uh, much more robust use of the oversight powers of the Intelligence Committee and to really drill down on how excessive secrecy um, is, is used to protect misconduct in the US government. It, it, it could remove some of the necessity of some of these whistleblowers if the lawmakers were doing their job. Thank you both so much for those insights. We've really welcomed your comments and your, your expertise and, and how you shared that with us today. I know our community has benefited so much from hearing what you've had to say on these topics based on your years and years of work in this area. So thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, I'll just remind everyone that this discussion has been recorded and is available online through the Human Rights Institute webpage. Our next event will be on October 7th, again, on the civilian impacts of US operations in Somalia. And we hope that I think we may have lost Priyanka. Okay, well, Jamil, you and I can, we can sign off and people can find up. more information on their website or however they find it. Good to see you too, Jamil. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye, everybody. Hi.
Thank you everyone for joining us today. Our next event is on Thursday, October 7th. Uh, look out for information about that. Thank you. And thank you to our panelists.